today for the Linux Certification Virtue Summit, we have Andrew Mallet here. He has been a technical trainer for over 20 years, and now through his training and consultancy company in the UK, the Irvin Penguin, he is able to provide some of the best Linux training and support online. Please welcome the Urban Penguin himself, Andrew Mallet. How are you, Andrew? Well, hi, Tiffany. Thank you very much. And um, what an introduction. Um, yeah, I, I'm doing very good. Perfect. I'm glad to hear and thank you for being here today with us at the Linux Certification Virtual Summit. So tell us, who is Andrew Mallet? Well, I think you've already mentioned it. I am the Urban Penguin. Now, the Urban Penguin I set up all back in 2009. Um, I was a Linux trainer and I kind of needed a, a platform that I could show things in the class that weren't that easy to set up. So, I, yeah, I set up my YouTube channel. I became the Urban Penguin and now I am who you see today. Uh, but the big thing about having the YouTube shop window is it kind of opens me up to not just being able to deliver extra stuff, stuff within my own classroom, but know what other people want out there and what they're doing with Linux. And it's been a great vehicle to get myself involved in other organizations such as Pluralsight.com, who, who I write quite a lot of video courses for these days. Oh, perfect. So you said your YouTube channel is your, your platform for teaching Linux. Now, is that called the Urban Penguin or is it called something else, your YouTube channel? And just on uh, YouTube, it is the Urban Penguin. So, yeah, YouTube.com and the Urban Penguin. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. And what else do you do um, on Parallsite.com? So you pretty much write all of the content or the majority of the Linux content? Well, Pluralsight uh, are an online vendor of training materials. You can join them for a, a monthly subscription, so there's no ongoing contract. And they write training for pretty much all of the certifications out there, whether it's Linux, Unix, or I understand there's some other operating systems. Is there something called Windows? Did I hear something <laughs> like that, like something window -y? Um but, but, yeah, I write a lot of their Linux content, uh, including LPI and Linux Foundation training oh perfect perfect thank you for that all right so how did you get introduced into the world of linux well i think i like a lot of people we fall across it really um i, I was working where we needed directory services and directory services need accurate time so we started implementing linux just to be ntp or network time protocol servers and that's how I came across it. Didn't really know anything about it. Didn't really know what to do with it. But, but yeah, I think we're all newbies at some stage. Uh, and, yeah, you just pick it up. Yes, yes. I love the fact that you said you kind of learned it on your own and was a newbie to it. I think that's that's very important for folks who are just getting introduced to Linux to know that an expert was always a beginner. And that with just time and hard work, you can become a Linux expert like yourself. So thank you for that. Thanks. So um, in your bio, I did see that you are a Linux trainer, which you kind of spoke about. In addition to being Linux certified, uh, what made you decide to become a teacher of Linux? Well, I was teaching certification classes anyway. I've taught uh, Microsoft classes. I've taught Novell classes. Um, the big thing about teaching a Linux class is, of course, that Linux is free. So we can give the DVD, we can give virtual machines that have Linux installed, which is just great. Um, yeah, I think you know, you've been involved in uh, certification yourself, Tiffany, so you're well aware of this, that many vendors will give you a DVD to take away, but it might be you know, 90 days or 180 days evaluation. So, yeah, you can deploy it, but, but yeah, eventually you're going to have some problem at the end because it stops working, yes. whereas, of course, with Linux, it's free. And actually, I, yeah, I find that, that really amazing that we can give students a product uh, and they can use it, they can copy it, they can give it to their friends. So, yeah, 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 I, I, I really like the idea of that. And with obviously some of the very cheaper hardware that's available, I do a lot of Linux training where 
uh, I run classes on the Raspberry Pi. And, well, to be honest, the cost of the Pi is included in the course. Mm. So take away the Raspberry Pi with them, which is, again, I think quite liberating when you get to take away the computer that you worked on. Mm -hmm. I agree. And Raspberry Pi is a a very famous, you know, um, operating system hardware that's out there that a lot of folks love. So, yes, I think that's that's great (laughs) that it's included with the class. Thank you. So um, what made you decide to become a Linux Professional Institute certified engineer? Well, to be one better than the rest, really. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, and this goes back to, to, to me even at school. Yeah, I didn't want to be the best, but I just wanted to be better than the average. So whatever really the average was in the class, yeah, I just needed to be a bit higher than that. And then I would be happy. Um, so, of course... Yeah, the the LPI, the Linux Professional Institute, have made a real success out of the LPIC Level 1, really, really popular certification, but then probably every man and his dog has it. (laughs) And, of course, you need LPIC 1 to be able to move into LPIC 2, but, but yeah, LPIC 2 just sets me apart from everyone else as a real differentiator. Um, And and also, I think this is a tip for the exams as well. if your pass mark is 63% and say, well, all you really need is 64%, you're wasting your time if you get anything higher. Mm-hmm. So, it, yeah, it's just a pass in these exams and you just need to be above that pass mark. Mm-hmm. Perfect. I loved how you say you wanted to be a step above. You know, I think that that speaks to your competitive nature, which is great. And the fact that you want to be one of the best. And I think that that's why it propelled you to become a Linux expert that you are today. So thank you for that, Jim. Um, How did you gain the amount of experience that you needed before you took the LPIC 2 exam? Yeah, this is... um I, I think your, your choice of words there, Tiffany, using experience is, is is well chosen. This probably isn't one of the exams that you can sit down, read a book and be able to write the exam at the end of it. Obviously, some people can do that, but you need to really understand the operating system and have a really good understanding of what you're really being asked within these questions. So where I work is that I work with a lot of small clients. So I get involved in being able to install different distributions, not just one distribution. And I get to see pretty much the full gamut of services that they are going to be using. Yeah, so I'm not just going to be setting up yeah, file servers. I'm not just going to be setting up directory servers. I'm going to be setting up pretty much everything a small organization is going to need. There's no reason, though, that if you are studying this at home, yeah, I don't want to be putting people off thinking that they've got themselves consultancy jobs. But there's no reason why you can't then go through and set up your own virtual machine labs, be it at home or work. But then make sure that you do work through everything that is mentioned. So when you're looking at setting up web servers, the requirements for the exam expect you to know how to set up the Apache HTTP daemon as well as going through setting up the Nginx web server. And it's the same thing when we look at domain name services, DNS. You can expect to know the bind implementation and other implementations, including things like DNS mask. So certainly going through the objectives and working through each one of those objectives and making sure you've been through each one of those bullet points. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So I just want to ask you a a quick question from what you said about um, consultant. Um, As a Linux consultant, how has that kind of impacts your life or has it given you a um, uh, life balance? How, How has that I'm probably asking the incorrect question here, but give me a second. Um, And don't worry, we'll edit this out since I'm kind of brain farting. But pretty much what I'm trying to ask you is how has being a consultant for Linux provided you with life work balance? 
Yeah, I, I think you know so much now. You do read uh, in 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 the, the the press or on web is how we must have this work life balance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think being able to work for myself, both in a training and a consultancy environment, really does mean that I can choose when and how I work, uh, which, of course, a lot of people don't have that opportunity to do. Uh, and, it, yeah, yeah, I think a lot of people would want to work for themselves. And I think, well, just do it, really. Yeah. yeah. It doesn't matter if you're uh, working in an environment such as Linux or you're working in an environment uh, with Microsoft or working in in a database situation. Well, no, just go out there and, and, and do what you want. Take take the risk. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I love it. So how do you get your clients? Uh, a lot of the clients I think I, I do find through social media. You know, people have seen my videos on YouTube or they see my tweets. So, the, you know, people will ask. And obviously, I can help them with, yeah, simple questions over the web. But, yeah, yeah, they, they'll say, well, okay, can you come in and do this for me? Or we need we need someone who can come in, uh, yeah, and, and, and teach us about Linux and get Linux up and running in our organization. So, again, I think getting yourself out there, getting yourself on social media is always a, a great help because it is a showcase for your skills. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Thank you so much, Andrew. And just thank you for um, being flexible to segue into those two questions. I think they're important for folks to, who obtain Linux skills and want to look at the next step in the sense of, you know, not everyone wants to work for someone else for the rest of their life. So, so how did you prepare for your LPIC 2 exam? Yeah, well, to prepare for LPIC 2, yeah, it, it's like settling up for any exam, isn't it? Different people are going to do things in different way. But I personally like to read the uh, LPI website. They've done a great job in laying out all of the objectives and making it quite clear as to what is required. So using that as a list and then just going through, making sure that you understand what they're talking about it, uh, yeah, makes it pretty easy. Yeah, I, I set up virtual machines. I was then able to go through and say, okay, we need to know about the squid web proxy server we need to know uh, about the lvm file system so you just go through and make sure that you set all of that up and run through so yeah uh it's like anything i think you mentioned before it's just a a lot of hard work uh, and being determined to meet your goals perfect perfect so what was your studying routine well, I suppose it's like anything, isn't it? We all have our own routines and and, and and deciding when and how we're going to study. The important thing is, again, I think it comes back to a little bit of that experience that we were talking about before. But if you like Linux and you like IT administration, then it isn't drudgery. So the study can be fun and you're learning, taking on new things. But you know, when you're when you're studying something, what I don't what I don't really want to do is just sit down and think I have to study this because I will start on it and I will Google something and I'll go off on a tangent. Yeah, the path then just takes me somewhere else. So I'm still learning. It's not necessarily the objective that I set out to. But in that way, it's it's still fun. Yeah, I, I will eventually get everything covered, but sit back, enjoy the ride. Mm-hmm. And also, when you're looking at it, the same way as well, with the LPIC Level 1, you've got two exams. And I would treat the two exams for LPIC Level 2, the 201 and the 202 exams, as completely separate. You know, so study for, doesn't matter which one you do first, but study, let's say, for 201 Get that over and done with, then study for 202. Mm-hmm. Don't try and work through the complete objective set mm-hmm. and then try and do the exams because you're probably not going to retain the information. Mm-hmm. And what you do in 201 isn't necessarily going to help you in 202 and vice versa. So keep them as separate units and enjoy. Yeah. I like how you say enjoy the process. I think a lot of times... We as people in general, we just don't take the time to enjoy the process, you know, the studying process to 
take it all in. I feel like nowadays we're just so focused on rushing through and just getting it done and not focusing on the process. So I, I, I enjoy that you said just take it all in. I really do. So um, are there any specific resources that helped you prepare for the exam at all? We have to be very careful when you're looking um, for resources for LPIC Level 2. There was a major update to the exams in November uh, 2013. So we have to be careful that if you're looking at training material, that it was published really after that date. Mm. So be very careful when you're looking at that. One quick tip is to go through... And generally, these training books are going to list, again, much like the website, objective by objective. So check to see if they have objective 200, 200. If they don't, then it's for the old exam. The objective 200, it's like monitoring your servers. And they brought this in in, the, uh, in November 2013. Having said that, we don't want to say that there aren't resources out there, but the LPI website, again, is very good. But also, if you don't mind reading stuff from the web, there is a company, a Dutch IT company called Snow, mm -hmm. and they set up a website, lpic2.unix.com. NL, NL for the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, and they go through each objective with explanations. So that's a good free resource as well. So it's not, you don't have to pay money, isn't it? Yeah, that's a great thing. So can you say that website one more time so folks can make sure they have it? Yeah, it's lpic2.unix.nl, November Lima. Perfect. Thank you so much. Okay, so how long after you received your LPIC 1 did you begin studying to take the LPIC 2? Well, yeah, certainly not straight away. Um, yeah, when I originally took my LPIC 1, I needed it to be able to teach a group of courses. So my LPIC 1 was purely to meet a need. And it almost goes back to, to what you were talking about earlier, Tiffany, when you said that you know, often people take certifications just quickly, they rush through them. And that's often because they need it to meet a certain requirement that so many companies have to have X amount of certified employees. So that's kind of pushed the certification market as well. But also then pushes, you know, people just rushing through getting the certification and then almost forgetting it. So that's certainly what I did with my LPIC level one. It was to meet a certain need. But then as I set up my own company, I needed to, as we said before, differentiate myself. So probably about it was probably about four years after my LPIC one is that I then took the LPIC two. Um, so again, it was the, the two exams, and I, I, I did one one month, and then the next month I took the second exam. Mm -hmm. Great, great. I like how you said that you took four years before you took the LPIC two. I think that's that's really important for folks to understand, not to rush into your next certification. You know. <laughs> yeah, but, but but people are also different, and yeah. I think the LPI have uh, had a story last year of somebody who. He took all of the exams, so LPIC Level 1, LPIC Level 2, and even the the advanced specialist uh, LPIC Level 3, and they did that in something like uh, six months. Um, so he was supposedly was new to Linux, but I'm guessing he had experience or quite a lot of experience uh, in something else. So, yeah, you know, some people are, are absolute uh, whiz kids and, <laughs> and they can rush through it. But, but yeah, 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 it, it took me a little while. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Great, great. Thank you. So uh, are there any particular commands and objectives that you made sure you knew inside and out before you took the exam? Yeah, I suppose, again, it's, it, it's just looking at the lazy side of life here, really, isn't it? So if you go through the LPI website, so just go to the LPI.org, you'll be able to go through and see all of the exam objectives for each of their exams. And each exam is, or each objective for the exam is laid out with a weighting number. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to go through and see the weight of that objective. And each objective is, is, is part of a bigger topic. And even the topics have a weight. Mm -hmm. And when we're looking at that objective 200.1, remember I was saying, you know, topic 200 was new. Yes. So 200.1, measure and troubleshoot resource usage, 
Well, that has a weight of six. Now, what that, that relates to is that six questions in the exam are going to be based on that single objective. So, of course, I'm going to spend a lot of time going through that. There are 60 questions in the exam. So 10% of the questions in the exam come from that one objective. So it really becomes a great way of finding out what you really need to know and where you need to work on in the exam. Compare it to, to another objective, 206.1, notify users and system related issues. That just has a weight of one. So you could almost go through it and then just thinking there might be some areas that you are completely unclear about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is um, the, uh, uh, op the open VPN server is an objective. And you might say, well, I'm never going to set that up. I've never set it up and it's difficult to set it up in my lab. But we look at it, it's got a weight of two. I would kind of look at that and just think, yeah, I'm happy to take a hit on that one. But if it had a weight of four or five or even higher going into six, like we saw with the measure and troubleshoot resource usage, there's no way I'm, I'm not going to set that up and go through it. So it, it's not so much just going through yeah, the individual commands. It's being able to look at the resources that have been given to you by the LPI and go by the weighting. The weighting tells you how many questions you're going to get in the exam. All right. So how did you navigate taking this exam? Yeah, this is a, this is a straightforward forms based exam. So, yeah, the thing you're probably used to multiple ch choice questions. So certainly most of the questions are going to be multiple choice, but a few of them are going to be type in the box. Now, when you're going through the exam, you do get the process to look at the question and there's a little tick box right at the top of the page that says mark this question. Now, mark the question is actually just marking it for a review. It's not grading the question, so don't get confused with their terminology. But if you go through and mark questions that you're uncertain of, at the end of the exam, you then get a chance to review any of your questions that perhaps you are a little bit uncertain of. If you've chosen to mark the ones that you're uncertain of, then you might see hopefully just three or four questions that you need to go back and review. If you haven't marked the questions that you're a little bit uh, uh, cautious with your answers on, then you've got to go back and look at every question, trying to find out which was the question I wasn't certain on. So, so yeah, just, just make sure you do use the exam system for your benefit by marking questions so you can then go back and review them at the end if you're uncertain. Because you never know, yeah, a question they ask you early on they might answer themselves later on in the multiple choice exam. So, uh, yeah, yeah, mark the questions you're uncertain of and review them at the end. Yes, yes, that's a great, great technique. I actually use that one myself when I take um, certifications, and I've noticed that a question I've marked, as I put that one, marked that, and kept going, there was another question that kind of answered the question I marked. So you're right on the money with that one. <laughs> so how did uh, LPIC2 certified Linux engineer impact your life? Yeah, I think you, you can look at this of, of, of almost like why take any certification. Um, if, if you really take the certification seriously and you do work at it so you understand what you're studying, then you're going to really understand the product better. So, of course, for me, this has helped me understand the internal workings of uh, Linux. And having that better understanding then opens up a lot of opportunities for me. Yeah, the, yeah, Linux does so much and being able to understand what everything does gives you an idea of how best you can solve solutions, be it for yourself, working in your own organization, or be it for customers. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it really has given me a lot of opportunities. And as we were talking before about that, that life-work balance, 
it's now given me the opportunity where it's becoming very profitable for me working in Linux. So, yeah, I, I, I pretty much can choose what I do when I do it. And uh, and certainly I can study exactly what I want. And, and I, I've worked for other training companies before. And, and, of course, you just get no time off. You're really, really busy and you don't get time to really investigate the things that you want. But yeah, yeah, my life is just perfect now, Tiffany. Perfect. I loved how you, you mentioned, you know, from from everything you said, I just heard the words freedom. You have the freedom to do what you want in the sense of how you teach, who you pick up as clients. And I think that's a great thing. It's a great thing. So what advice would you give a person like myself who's considering taking the LPIC 2 exam? Well, I suppose being clear on what you want to achieve, okay. you know, just having a bunch of certifications, a, you know, a bunch of ribbons saying you've achieved this and that, yeah, it, it doesn't really mean a lot and it's not going to be necessarily impressive to an employer. So having a certification and know how you're going to use that certification gives you focus on how you're going to market yourself. Mm. So again, okay, LPIC level two is saying that you are becoming a very knowledgeable person, the expert, the go-to person in Linux. Mm -hmm. So you can then start using wording on your resume or your CV, whatever you like to call it, mm -hmm. to be able to say that that I, I, I'm not just LPIC level one certified, but I've gone that extra step so you can be assured that I'm going to be a good fit in your organization. So even though if you're looking at jobs and they, you know, many jobs will say, yes, they require LPIC level one. Well, yeah, you know, go for it. But make sure you're, you're blowing your own trumpet by saying, look, I've got LPIC one and I've got LPIC two. Uh -huh. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So how difficult is LPIC 2 compared to all the other Linux engineer exams on the market, would you say? Well, yeah, difficulty, I suppose, is always one of these subjective things. But, but, but let's just take the two types of certification exams that Linux offers. You've got your practical exams where you're sat on the machine and working on it. Mm -hmm. And then you have your forms base, like the LPIC exams. Now, I think personally, I found a lot of fear of the practical based exams okay. because they're not what people are used to. You know, I think the IT market or certainly the certification market is sort of like developed around the, the traditional, if you like, the Microsoft style exams where yeah, you, you've just got a whole load of radio buttons and you just got to know what to to click. Okay. So people, of course, are a little bit frightened of a practical based exam. But I would actually say the LPIC level two being a forms based exam makes it a little bit more difficult because you have got to know the fact there is no way to work out the answer. So I, I, I think LPIC level two is actually quite difficult. Okay. And it's not just expecting you to know Red Hat or no, just Ubuntu, the different Linux distributions, you're expected to know Linux. So Red Hat, Ubuntu, SUSE, mm -hmm. you know, it's all going to be thrown in and the different versions of them. So there are big differences between uh, Ubuntu 1404 and 1604. Mm -hmm. There are big differences between CentOS 6 and CentOS 7. And you're going to be expected to know the earlier and the later versions. Mm. But also check the LPI websites for updates. The exams, of course, do need to be kept up to date. And our next update for LPIC Level 2 is going to be in January 2017. Mm. So next year there will be a minor update. And as, as changes and trends change in Linux, you do expect the exam to reflect those new changes. So, Andrew, before we wrap up, I want to know from you, where do you see Linux in five years from now? 
So you're you're asking me to pull out my crystal ball, is that it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I think I was the guy, oh, I don't know, maybe 30 years ago installing Amstrad desktop PCs when the desktop PCs first came out. And we had DOS and we had DOS Gem, which was kind of a, a, a Windows precursor. And I used to tell people, don't use the Windows environment because it just doesn't work. It's too difficult. It will never take off. Mm -hmm. So I don't think I'm the best person to make predictions, really, because, yeah, the GUI, I think, did win over. <laughs> but let's just take a stab at something. Let's just look at, at, at what's been happening over the previous five years that you know linux has been around it's been around for what 25 years now we've just had happy birthday uh linux so it's been around 25 years and people have been saying oh you know ever since i've been involved in linux that this is going to be the year of linux we are going to start seeing the linux desktop and we haven't so there there are things that have been predicted in the past that haven't happened but recently, the uptake of Linux has just been phenomenal. Of course, much of our virtualization through products like OpenStack is based around Linux. And for people who want to start selling virtual machine space on the Internet, well, of course, they are going to be all based around Linux. And very much they're offering Linux distributions through OpenStack. We can even see in the Microsoft arena with Azure, they're having people trained up in Linux and in their new Azure certification, it actually requires Linux knowledge to be able to gain that Microsoft certification. So there's a lot of really interesting things happening and showing the focus of Linux, both in certification and in the workplace. So I would say when we look at the next five years, we're going to see a much greater uptake on Linux within the server environment. And of course, appliances, virtual machines or containers that you are downloading that are pre-configured. Again, yeah, the, the idea of downloading an appliance is that it has to have a free operating system. We can't include licenses with it. So really, Linux lends itself to this appliance market where we have pre-configured system services already built for you on Linux that you are downloading. So I think we're just going to see a greater uptake of Linux services. And also, I think there is an opportunity for the Linux desktop. As more applications become web-based, then the use of the desktop as we know it changes. We do everything through a browser, then we're not dependent on applications. And that means then that we can start using applications that don't care about the underlying operating system. Mm -hmm. So as a quick summary there, we can really see a continued increase in the server market and probably an increase in the desktop market as our use of desktop computers change in favor of online services. Perfect. Thank you so much, Andrew. It has been a pleasure. The Urban Penguin himself. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Tiffany, and very, uh, I'd like to thank you very much for inviting me. You are more than welcome. Take care.